Welcome back everyone for today's um, practice talk um, in this on the second day of process mining camp. Um, so today we are very happy to have a have a talk given about um, yeah, customer customer journey analysis, customer lifecycle mining. And it's given by uh, Kamen Vermeer and Noortje Groendal from uh, Total uh, in, Net in the Netherlands. Welcome Kamen and Noortje. Thanks for joining us Hi. today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Much. Good afternoon. <laughs> so I understand you are both from from different departments, actually, right? Have have you worked together before, or is this the first common project that you have done? Yeah, yeah, we work together uh, actually quite a lot uh, within our organization. We have a data department, but since our capacity is uh, is limited, we try to work a lot with different kind of business uh, entities. And Orange, as part of the market, uh, marketing department, is working a lot with data. So we uh, involve her and others a lot in our uh, in our project, and we end up working together in this uh, process mining. Yeah, when we were, it all came together when we started a retention project where we needed every uh, disciplines from multiple departments uh, as well, and that's when we decided to go forward on this. All right. All right. So we are really curious already about about your story. So uh, I know Norte, you will start, um, yeah, introducing the project and telling us what you did. And um, yeah, so please, please go ahead and start now. Okay. Well, of course, welcome everyone. And Carmen and I want to, would like to thank Anne, of course, from Fluxicom for inviting us to speak at this year's process mining camp and uh, together with our colleague Martijn we've been working on the business case internally for process mining and during this presentation we will share our uh, our findings and the type of analysis we've done. Uh, first I would like to share a little bit about who is Total. Most of you probably know Total as a major energy uh, player that produces and markets fuels and natural gas we'd also do the same for electricity. Um, Total's ambition is to become the responsible energy major, major and achieve net zero emission in 2050. And then that's the Total Group, but we work for Total Gas and Power in Nederland, which is obviously based in the Netherlands, and we are a B2B energy supplier. Um, at Total Gas and Power Nederland, we have formulated four main KPIs, where sustainable growth, customer intimacy, and effic efficiency and quality align very well with process mining. In order to become closer with our customers and offer the products and services that they need, we need to know how they behave, not just how we think they should behave. Um, when analyzing and improving uh, the efficiencies of our system and departments, you also need to know how long a customer dispense at each stage. That is why we decided that process mining would be a valuable tool to help us move uh, further. So stop making assumptions about the customer journey, but look at the actual picture instead. Um, so as you can uh, see on this slide, traditionally all departments were improving their own processes and they had their own set of KPIs and they knew if they were in the red, amber or green. Uh, for example, if you look at the red arrow here, you see customer service analyzing all their call data. But because we want to put the customer at the center, we need to change our perspective. Uh, an individual department view will no longer do, and that's why we flip everything around, like you see in this image. By doing so, we can start to understand the customer journey, because we, instead of having a view of one department, we go across all departments. Um, and then the next step for us will be, what do we identify as a successful and an unsuccessful journey? Uh, and then we can formulate actions to improve customer satisfaction and evaluate the impact of those actions. So what, uh, what did we expect the customer journey to look like? Um, a new customer, we sell energy contracts, so that's good to know. So uh, a new customer comes in after signing their energy contract. And then they will be in a cool off stage for 14 days where they can freely cancel the contract. That's also, uh, uh, you need to do that for Dutch law. 
um, but also, of course, it's good phase for a customer to consider their contract. Um, we then move to the onboarding A phase. In the onboarding A phase, which we're not yet supplying the customer with electricity, but we are preparing them for the switch from their old supplier to us. And then in onboarding B, we have a lot of first with our customer. So we have the first month of supply, we have the first invoice and probably the first call because maybe something went wrong and we are getting to know each other. And then in the engagement phase, that's where we build a relationship with our customers. We had a first, the first errors have been smoothened out, hopefully, of course, and uh, and we can yeah start talking about other stuff than the first than the first invoice. And the next step in that uh, customer life cycle is retention, and this is where the contract of the con uh, customer almost ends. And of course, we want to offer a renewal con offer to the customer. And then if they end up renewing uh, with us, they go back to engagement because then we are uh, back again in a stage where we can just build a relationship. And we consider this a successful customer journey. And unsuccessful is when they move from uh, intention to win back and switch to another supplier. That's both for us, of course, that's seen as unsuccessful. Um, and then, if we look at how do you organize a process, uh, a project like this, well, you can imagine that we need all different kind of capabilities. And that is why Karma was involved as a business intelligence analyst with uh, she acts like a translator. So she knows a lot about data, but she also knows a lot about the business. And that's why she can easily translate the requirements of the business towards uh, the data team. And we also uh, attracted another business intelligence analyst, Martijn, who was involved as a data expert. And he helped us create the perfect data set on a customer level. Um, and therefore, of course, we needed to combine a lot of data, but more on that later on. Uh, and I was involved as a marketing intelligence analyst to help understand and create the customer lifecycle. So what do we want the customer lifecycle to be? Um, and what did we want to know? So first of all, we wanted an unbiased, clear view of a typical customer journey. Um, the one that's valid for the majority of our customers. So we didn't want to be sugar-coated, we wanted to know the truth. Um, and next, the next phase, we wanted to, we, we split the journey in success, so the renewal and unsuccessful, a contract termination. And we wanted to know if there were differences in those journeys. Um, and here I want to talk about a little bit more about the different data sets. Um, yeah, to do this, we need the expertise from the business to know which customers' transactions to include and the data experts to actually combine all the data. Um, and therefore, we need to link multiple data sources. So we have a CRM system where all contract information is stored. Avaya we use for recording incoming phone calls. Uh, Hogazel uh, we use for invoicing. And like most organizations, we also still have some Excel files for some processes. And to combine everything in one gigantic data set, Martijn used ClickSense. And ClickSense is a data visualization and self-service BI tool, which uh, makes sure you can easily link all data sets together. Um, and, um, and from there, we try to use one gigantic table, but before uh, it can, yeah, before that uh, can go into journey minor, we need to have the gigantic table and we need to use a unique customer ID because with this customer ID, we can aggregate all events to that customer level. So you can imagine that some events don't take place on a customer level in your system, but for example, on a contract level and all of that needs to go up uh, a level to customer and some uh, information maybe needs to go down to a customer level. And then we use the timestamps of the events to match the moment of the event for that specific customer to their customer lifecycle phase. And then we can bind all activities for all customers. And then you can see an example of that, what the uh, table would look like. So if you follow the, uh, blue, uh, the blue, the green <laughs> arrow, you can see what an example on one customer uh, would look like. 
and then uh, maybe to show it in a different light again on how it would look on the customer life cycle. So this is a very basic representation uh, of the whole data set. Um, and you can see in this example, this customer signed a contract on the 31st of December. This means when they called on the 1st of January, they were still in the cool off phase. Uh, because the cool phase was 14 days until after signing the contract. And we did this for every activity to get the table, um, yeah, to get all the activities matched to the phase the customer was in. So now uh, Carmen will go into more detail with our adventure with Disco Journey Miner. Yes, thank you so much, Noortje, for, for your first part of this uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to take you all along uh, on the phase of the real process mining journey that Norch and I took um, because before we started process mining obviously Norch and I watched some videos on YouTube and saw some process mining demos on, on, on different kind of congresses and once you see those kind of presentations you, you immediately think okay I want to have this kind of visual in the end uh, and I immediately see the bottleneck and I know where my action should be uh, but we figured out that the process mining journey is, yeah, it's quite challenging. Uh, when we started and we had our entire event table, yeah, obviously you can imagine it's quite big because for all the customers, we had all the activities that the customer had uh, one table, so that is a huge spaghetti. And we were really struggling with finding uh, a place where to start. Uh, because we were triggered by lots of kind of exceptions that immediately uh, uh, got our attention and we clicked on the the, the video uh, tool within demo and uh, within disco and we saw like many balls so we had some help from Fluxicon and then we figured out okay let's start with just getting the most common uh, logical life cycle in place uh, and we did that by doing a lot of filtering uh, the data quality was not always good so we had to filter out some data mostly historical data to to get more uh, a grip on our data set and we also use some other filtering to ensure not having the right time to go uh, through customer journey analysis were filtered out and once we did that we were able to create the logical life cycle of our customers and the image that Norcha just showed uh, in another format, of more like how the process mining one would look, would, would be something like this. So you have the cool off phase that we have in the beginning, the customer goes to the onboarding A, onboarding B, engagement, retention, um, and could also um, analysis we did to answer our first main question. And um, here, um, we found out that first interesting thing, most of the customers actually went from the call phase to onboarding A and then to onboarding B. So they followed the customer journey as we would expect. However, some of the customers went from the call off phase to onboarding B, which is interesting because that means that a customer is uh, having his 14 days after the contract is signed and then immediately have the start of their contract. While this period of the onboarding A phase is very important for the organization to get everything in place that once the customer gets switched, so the customer is an active customer within our portfolio, everything is right. So all the data from the customer is collected, is entered into our systems um, to ensure that, for instance, the billing, the first milestone of the customer in the engagement phase, is going well. So an important phase that is skipped by some customers, and we will get back to it, uh, to this uh, finding also when we compare the successful and unsuccessful customer journey. The second one we found was that in the end, we have customers who go from the engagement phase right to the win back phase. Uh, that means that this customer didn't have a, uh, a retention attempt from uh, our side. Uh, and that's obviously a waste because it's easier to retain a customer that you already have than getting new ones uh, within the organization. So um, we could share already two of these great findings uh, with our team, but we want to go further into the data and go to a more detailed level to answer our uh, second and third main question. And what we did here was that we compared the unsuccessful and the successful customer journey. And we did that by adding flags to the different uh, kind of customers who either had a retention and were back in the engagement phase 
or were unsuccessful customers and had a win back. So all of their contra contracts were terminated. Um, so we had these two groups and we could compare them. Uh, we could compare them and we had those two images here and I will walk you through the differences we could find. First of all, uh, we could see that uh, customers who are in an unsuccessful customer journey um, often had a call and then afterwards had another call. That could be for multiple reasons, uh, because the process money tool obviously don't tell you exactly why that is happening, but we could see that customers are calling again. And you can imagine that if you are a customer, you have to call again, probably have a question that is not answered fully or incorrect. Um, on the other hand, we saw that in a successful customer journey, a call leads to a case. And in this sense, a case could be confusing because in process mining, we use the case ID as the identification of a row in your event table. However, uh, we use a case within the organization to refer to a customer request. We call that a case, um, which is a good thing because if you call as a customer, we create a case. It's sent to our, to our back office and they are going to work on your case and resolve your question. Um, so that's the first finding uh, we had. Secondly, Georgia was already talking about you have a lot of firsts in your onboarding B phase. So you have a lot of uh, uh, first contacts with our organization and one of them is the first invoice. And you can imagine that it's it's a very important step, but so far because so far you had uh, you were in touch with our organization, uh, you signed your contract, but now it's the first time you actually have to pay uh, for your electricity or gas. Um, and if you uh, in a, are in an unsuccessful customer journey, it often was the case that after a first invoice, a customer called the organization. And that could be maybe because there was something wrong on the invoice or maybe something was unclear. Uh, and we don't see this call for the successful customer journey. So there is a, a great improvement uh, that could be made within the organization regarding the invoices. Uh, obviously, further analysis has to be done on what the specific questions were be were uh, in place for the successful customer journey to find out what the exact improvements would be. That means that uh, again, the case is here referred to. Uh, oh, let's see that the presentation, I shall wait a second. Let's see. Yeah, good. Um, what we found also is that a case, and this, uh, uh, in this case again, uh, it's uh, a customer request. It's followed up by a customer request again uh, in an unsuccessful customer journey. Uh, and we didn't find this loop in a successful customer journey. Uh, so uh, we could raise that to our operational uh, people within the organization to uh, ask what is going wrong here. Is there maybe, uh, does it take too long to answer a question? So a customer wants to have an, a, an answer, so is answering a question again. Or maybe there are different kind of processes that could be improved to limit the amount of questions regarding this, uh, this topic. So we found those three main uh, uh, improvements that could be made and we uh, told our uh, operational department, um, yeah, we shared these findings and we told them, okay, well, you know, this is what we found. What can we do about it? And are you excited about process mining? Can you see what we, what we can do with it? So uh, this could be of great help, of course. Um, and while Norte and I were very excited and the operational department was uh, very excited as well, uh, we are facing some challenges because at this moment we're not uh, yeah, very much using the process mining tool. Uh, and I think that's for several reasons at this moment. And I'm very happy to discuss this uh, with everyone in the community because I think it could be a challenge for, for many organizations. Um, the first challenge we have is that there's still discussion who takes ownership of this kind of tooling. Should it be the business intelligence analysts who are responsible for the data? Should it be the business analysts who work a lot with the different kind of processes and could use the tool to improve their analysis? Or maybe it should also be the business who is implementing the different kind of actions and could see very uh, easily if their actions are, are working or not. On the other hand, uh, Norch and I tried a few weeks. Uh, we started the tool and then we worked for two hours or three on it and then you leave it uh, at your desk for a week and then you start. And then if you're entering spaghetti again, you have to really think through, okay, what did we do? 
uh, how did we use the filtering last time. So we figured out, okay, if you want to work with this tool and get the most out of it, you really have to have dedicated resources who work on it and also to develop the competencies that are needed to, to work with the tool properly and get everything um, out of all the different kind of possibilities that the tool is, off the tool is offering. And finally, uh, and that's also a challenge that we're still facing, uh, you could provide the analysis, but it's very important to also have a follow-up action, uh, then evaluate that action to improve your process and then do the analysis. And that's sort of, uh, yeah, the result of the first two challenges. If you don't have that, those in place, it's very difficult to create that feedback loop. Uh, so we're still finding a, a ways to, to make this work. Uh, but we're very happy to discuss these kind of challenges with uh, with everyone here in the community. We're very uh, excited and interested to hear how did you do this within uh, your organizations? Do you have best practices? Um, and we're very happy to share that, uh, well, a bit of it today and hopefully uh, a lot more tomorrow. Uh, so this was it from our side. Uh, thank you, Anna. I think it's uh, back over to you. Thank you both. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Nortje, for, for sharing your, your post-mining uh, customer journey analysis. And um, yeah, so you you made a very good um, segue here already to, to the community. So you're very clearly asking for feedback on concrete questions that you, um, yeah, yeah, that you are having at the moment. So anyone who maybe has done some, also some customer journey analysis on their own or um, has ideas about this can yeah not just ask more questions to you, but also maybe share their own perspectives. And so, so we can all discuss together what the, what the best approach is and tomorrow we will be coming back. But before we do that, I just yeah, I want to also um, ask a few questions uh, myself. So, uh, so for example, one thing I was I was wondering um, is um, yeah that or let's say what you see frequently in customer journey analysis is that uh, it's important to look at the interactions of the customer because you are looking at the process from the customer perspective, right? Like not to like you outlined, that's exactly the shift that you are making, not looking from a functional internal perspective, but really looking from this outside perspective. How does the customer interact with our com with our company? And to do that, you you want to you know, follow the steps of the customer. So you need some kind of customer ID or some kind of customer, um, yeah, you need to correlate the things that belong together. So I'm curious in your, uh, in your data preparation, was that difficult? Did you already have all the things that belonged you know, to the same customer journey instance uh, correlated, or did you have to take some? Did, did you have to yeah take some extra steps to to make that work? Yeah, uh, well, we were very happy to have Martin on board uh, because he knows our data system very well, uh, and he told us also that it was quite a challenge to get everything in place because. Um, for instance, if you have the call, it's not directly related to a client ID. So you have a call which is uh, connected to a phone number, which is connected to an, in another way to your customer in your CRM system, but you have to find all your ways to connect it. So it was quite difficult, uh, but in the end, um, we could get everything in place and connect it to, to the client level. So it was possible and there was not necessarily like assumptions to be made. Um, but sometimes you had to sort of take an indirect way of uh, connecting everything uh, to your customer, yes. And I think what, what helps is that because you, in the end, you delete or uh, get rid of all the anomalies, you, yeah, it doesn't matter if your data set is not like 100% correct, it doesn't need to be get down to 80%, but I think having like a, a couple of data errors where you're not able to link a phone number to uh, a customer or phone call uh, will not impact the analysis that heavily. So you need to be able to uh, to link most, but not all. Yeah. Right. Yes. And uh, yeah, maybe a little bit related to that. So I also I saw one question in the in this in the Slack community post by Luis, who was wondering what if a customer has more than one contract. So does this not apply here because the customer is the unit, or is the customer contract the unit of? Yeah, so we have uh, a lot of customers with multiple contracts. So for example, gas and power, so that would count as two contracts. So we then um, 
we use to, to, to decide on which phase they are, we use the first contract for that customer, for example, because the first start of the customer will be the most important for them for having all the firsts. So there are multiple contracts, but we aggregated everything to customer level and not on contract level. And we did that specifically because in our organization, sometimes we have a bit of a it's called side. So a customer side is either a gas or a power mindset. And we want to uh, elevate it to a customer level and start thinking about a customer instead of a contract. Yeah, but it, but it's indeed a very good question because I think I know that we also had this discussion, you know, when is a customer then in a retention phase, you know, is it which of the contracts are we looking at if it to determine whether it's almost an ending contract because maybe a customer has a uh, hundred contracts because it's a huge, huge organization with, I don't know, for instance, um, an organization that has all kind of different shops within the, within the country, that could also be one customer, but has lots of contracts. So we were often discussing, you know, what's the best way to reflect whether this customer is in which phase. Um, so yeah, that was yeah. in the beginning was tricky. But once we uh, we made those uh, decisions on it, we just uh, were able to look at it from a customer's perspective uh, for each of the customers. Yeah, so having your definition straight and aligned internally is very important before you start because else you keep coming back to having these discussions. And I think it's good that uh, Carmen, Martin and I took a lot of time to finalize those uh, definitions. And then also having the perspective from somebody who knows the data and said, yeah, but you were going to run into this problem. Oh, let's think about that. And then from a business perspective, what do we think then is the best solution? Right, exactly. Yes, you, 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 indeed, you can often look at the data from different angles, right? And I, I think here it's, it's very, yeah, it's, it's, it's very clear that you can really do this from in many different ways. So, like you say, having the definitions really clear and being really clear about what you want to do based on the questions that you want to answer is, is kind of the prerequisite. Because otherwise, yeah, talking to the people you want to present the results with, there can be a, a lot of confusion very easily if, if this is not clear. Yeah. So maybe yeah. This brings me to the to the next question. I uh, I I heard that you mentioned that was a little bit of a challenge of yeah to learn process mining and doing yeah do your analysis and learn basically doing and learning at the same time, right? So do you have an, an example for that? What was maybe what you were um, yeah finding difficult or um, how how did you deal with that? Do you have already some some first insights so you can pass on to people who are in the same situation? Uh, I think in the end, the key was to, to keep it simple in the beginning because we had a data set that also had lots of different columns. So we had uh, and a column like on the activity level and also we, we added data theme. So you could sort of select a contract data theme or invoice uh, data theme or a call. Uh, and we also had the journey phases within it. Uh, but it was in the beginning, we had sort of everything together in the data set and then we started. Uh, and in the end, we sort of did it the other way around. So we select as less as possible, and then we we were uh, increasing our data set because we really figured out the more data you have, the more complex it gets. So we started only like looking maybe just select one month and see what happens. So your amount of cases is limited, uh, and then we could increase the amount of data while we proceeded in the process. But maybe Norcha, you have. Uh, another example. Yeah, like if uh, the the image karma show with the huge spaghetti, uh, that help on the slide. That's how we felt, and then actually we contacted uh, uh, you guys at Fluxicon, and uh, yeah, you guys convinced us. Like you don't need to include all the things that are not logical, that are probably data errors. So sometimes, for example, it can happen that a contract gets uploaded in the system after a customer uh, a supply has started and you just get rid of all that data because it's going to ruin your analysis. So I think that was also an important step for us to, to use actually the spaghetti to see where the data quality issues were and just remove that from the data set because it's not going to provide you any insights well, unless you want to, of course, analyze uh, data quality issues. Yeah. yeah, maybe to add on and add to that, because I think in the beginning we were also a bit afraid of uh, getting rid of lots of data because we were uh, feeling that maybe the reliability of our analysis would be would be less. Uh, but in the end, we saw that it was the only way to get 
uh, results that you can present and make a convincing argument about, even if it's only like a limited amount of uh, paths that you, you've selected. Um, I think, yeah, one advice would be just get rid of data that is not useful, even though you might remove a lot of it. Yeah. Right, really simplifying is the spaghetti. That's yeah, that's really for customer journey analysis. That's that's so important. Exactly. Okay, great. Um, um, I think I think that's a that's a nice place to end with this kind of common challenge and these these tips. Um, yeah, to yeah, not feel the need to look at everything, but um, simplify, leave some things out to look maybe at the normal process first. Um, to yeah to get some understanding and also yeah look at the data quality uh, i see that there's uh, quite a quite a bit of activity also in the in the slack community so i would say let's let's continue the discussion there um, so we're in the in the in the channel uh, in the total uh, channel uh, the discussion is going on and then we will be looking at the questions and continuing the discussion and then tomorrow both of you will be back uh, at the beginning of tomorrow's session and then we will um, pick up the discussion and connect the dots uh, from yeah. what was said there yeah great i think for slack is not the case that less data is good so just put everything <laughs> you want to ask into the slack and then we have a look at everything uh and uh, hopefully we can discuss most of it tomorrow and otherwise we will definitely get back to you uh, afterwards right perfect thank you both thank you for joining today and i'll see you all uh, tomorrow again for session number three bye bye thank you bye bye thank you so much Welcome back, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today at the third session of this year's Process Mining Camp. Uh, we are back today, uh, first of all, in our Process Mining Cafe with the speakers from um, last day's practice talk with Carmen and Norte from Total. Welcome back, Carmen and Norte. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> All right, so we got a lot of interesting discussions and questions in the Slack community. So um, you ended your presentation yesterday with uh, three questions or challenges that you were facing, where you were wondering how people relate to that, right? So the first question was, who takes ownership for um, yeah, a, a customer journey analysis like that, or better yet, from what you're doing with those insights afterwards? And so, for example, Jörg Petters, also, um, yeah, um, uh, pointed out that it was interesting that actually multiple calls uh, were triggered, right? That was one of the results in in your analysis, and um, yeah, he he says that while process mining points to the differences in customer journeys, is it it doesn't yet identify the underlying issues, right? Of of course, this is correct. So, the question is always then, how do you select and visualize best practices and present these back to the business lines so that they can do something with that? So, do you have any any best practices or any experiences or suggestions with this already? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I will pick up this answer. I think uh, besides York, there were many other questions related to, okay, you found these outcomes and what are you going to do with it? Uh, and what we did in the beginning was besides the customer journey analysis, we uh, also made an analysis that was related to operational efficiency. So we created another data set and I think that's also a question from Nick, how do you cooperate with like for instance if you talk about cases, when did you start and when did you end? So we created an entire new data set uh, where we did an analysis on the cases. So we uh, did uh, tracking of all the cases, who was routing the cases to whom, uh, also including which agents are involved in that, which departments are involved. Uh, Sean, I think you mentioned, you know, it's good to have some business rules in place. Uh, the management team did that. So they had five sort of golden rules that everyone needed to follow. Uh, so people were um, were followed in their in their work and see what the cases, where the cases were going. Uh, so we did an analysis on those five golden rules. 
uh, and also presented that to the management team, which was interesting because I think that also refers to, uh, to one of the questions related to transparency and how do you cooperate with process mining and then showing results to an audience that might not be very happy with showing that they did something wrong. Uh, so we were uh, involving the management team to show what you can uh, do with process mining and to ensure that it would not be sort of naming and shaming uh, but rather an instrument to, to grow as an organization. Um, and there was some, some other question about what do you do with, for instance, Lean Six Sigma? Well, we have a consultant within the organization who works on this topic. Um, so we also um, included her in the project to ensure that uh, she can pick up uh, with some of the teams to get really into the root causes of, of uh, the cases, for instance, why is that invoice not uh, send in a correct way, for instance, if we found out that a lot of cases were on this topic. And finally, what we did as a data team was also a best practice to get KPIs for all the teams to measure, for instance, for uh, for the cases, what's the time for people to pick up on a case, uh, how long does is the sort of throughput time of a case within the organization. Uh, so those KPIs are automated right now, and that's uh, it's all been done in ClickSense. Uh, so that all the different teams can monitor their KPIs uh, and see if they improve their process at least for, for their part of the process. So I think it's a combination between all those different kind of topics. Um, yeah, and we should dig further into that to get really to uh, the improvements and actions that, uh, that can be made to improve our processes and eventually create a more successful customer journey. Right, yes. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I mean, in, in, in a customer service process like that, um, the agents are always central, right? They're the ones, um, yeah, being really the ones who are interacting with the customers. So, for example, Mike uh, suggested to compare on the resource level to find significant better performance. And David had a similar suggestion, um, but had proposed to analyze on the level of the call center manager such that they can find opportunities for customized coaching. What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's that's a very good point. In our operational efficiency um, analysis, we included all the different uh, agents as well. Um, so uh, it would be a great suggestion after the analysis has been done uh, to show what different kind of uh, routing people are using and if they are following the five golden rules that we set up uh, and see if maybe some people need more training to immediately identify which case belongs to which department to solve it quicker, for instance. So I think that's a great suggestion and uh, we should definitely uh, work uh, towards that kind of, uh, yeah, like sort of custom made solution for every uh, agent. Yeah. Right. Well, um, in, in terms of ownership, of course, yeah, the question is always who is ultimately responsible, and that's particularly relevant for the for the customer journey, right? As it spans multiple departments and different oper operational areas, not just limited to to one functional area. So, yeah, it's is, is there someone responsible for the for the whole customer journey or the customer journey as a whole, or uh, will there remain a collaboration between the departments uh, in different teams? And do you start? Yeah, how do you start? Do you organize this in a in a bottom up way or in a on a top level, a top down way, so. Yeah, I saw this question indeed coming in from Fran, and this is also something uh, that's really important before you, before you start. I think the necessity for using a customer uh, life cycle needs to come from the business, um, because they are in the end the ones setting up the actions and creating the feedback loop. If you specifically talk about who owns the customer life cycle, uh, in my opinion, as being uh, responsible for marketing, I think marketing uh, should always be the uh, department that's responsible for the complete picture, but maybe not for all the individual actions, but making sure all the uh, important touch points are included for a, um, uh, for a customer. And then once the, the business is on board, so maybe the, then organized for marketing, uh, the data need genius just uh, can help to set up the first, for example, first, uh, journey mining experience and then once it's up and running uh, I think it needs to be hand over by, uh, to the business um, in order to create a short feedback loop but still it's something we still are discussing now so it's not uh, an easy 
question. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, may and maybe to, to add on to that, I think you, you eventually need all of uh, all of the people. So it's also sort of creating a joint focus at the same time. And it's a timing for each of the departments to sort of focus on this topic at, this, at the same time, because you should have everyone for their part on board. Um, so yeah, I think we're still looking for that optimum moment of uh, joint focus for process mining. Right. Yeah, that's exactly one of the one of the questions that yeah that is still still needs to fully worked out. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, well, yeah. Also, I think you you addressed that a little bit already, but it's always I think worth um, yeah talking about this topic. So Marcos, for example, mentioned that transparency could lead to blame and create pushback, um, and then ultimately prevent focus on really understanding the problem. So yeah, is 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 there something that you have learned from that or how, how you think that can be addressed? Yeah, I think what, what we try to do uh, in the organization is to provide a lot of training on what process mining exactly is. Uh, because if you don't do that, we notice that people have their own truth within the organization. They have their own views in the CRM system or they have their own excels, uh, which might tell a different story than you are going to tell in your process mining tool. Uh, and from the beginning on, we try to really explain what is process mining exactly? How did we get the data? It's the data that you use in your system. It's not something sort of we created. And I think those kind of trainings make sure that you take people along with you uh, along the journey and also limits the uh, anxiety for sort of naming and shaming within the organization. Um, so I think that was a, a good first step. Um, and then also uh, sharing the definitions and assumptions we took. That, like yesterday, Norch also mentioned it's very important to have those def definitions um, clear in the beginning. Uh, but that's for, for our side, but also for the people who are going to uh, work and take actions based on the tool. Uh, so we definitely have to share all those definitions and assumptions as well. And I think on general, in the topic of transparency, we also have customer satisfaction research, which can be linked yeah. back to our all our employees, sales or customer service. So um, yeah, to, in order to be honest with our feedback, you need to be able to share the feedback we are getting, but not blaming people if something is negative, but more looking at it, okay, so what can we do with this to improve? So that's also what we do, for example, with the customer satisfaction input. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really really important, right? To yeah, to to get people um, to buy in and to to work together on this. Um, yeah. So the the second question that you raised at the end of your presentation was uh, the question about how do we um, yeah set up the dedicated resources and competencies because that's quite clear I think for everyone who has started to look into process mining is that at first it looks very simple you just have some data you import it into the process mining tool you get a nice process map out of it but yeah there's there's a lot of things that you actually need to learn right some skills and and you like you mentioned you were kind of doing the analysis and learning a little bit at the same time so yeah so 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 it requires a certain mix of analytical and technical skills as well well as operational domain knowledge skills as as friend also pointed out so that you're not jumping to conclusions but yeah can based on the right technical knowledge and domain knowledge interpret this correctly so you have been already working on this in a um, yeah in a multidisciplinary team, but have you come any further on on your understanding? Like where should this be positioned? This competency really? Um, well, I think uh, we're still a bit discussing that because I think uh, within the organization uh, the most complex part in the beginning was getting the data set right. Uh, so you need to have the capacity there to also be a bit agile with working with your data set because if we have the competency to analyze with it with a business uh, analyst for instance who are analyzing the process you still have that dependency on uh, someone who needs to uh, change your data set quickly if you need something else an extra dimension or something um, so we're still in the in the discussion there uh, but we also noticed that we want a business to be really uh, enthusiastic about it and really want to work with it before we will start working with it because we can do great analysis, but only for the purpose that we really like to do analysis uh, on our end. Uh, but we want to continue with, with the project if the business is really showing that they're going to use it uh, and implement it in their, in their daily work. 
Yeah, because I think the real motivation to keep using this will come if you start seeing the results of your actions and then you get everybody enthusiastic and for that it needs to be landing in the in the business. Right. Yes, yeah, I, I completely I completely agree. Hmm. All right, so the, the third question was um, that you were raising as a challenge at the end of your presentation yesterday is how do you actually create the feedback loop, right? And I, I thought Markus had a good point here where he said, well, um, you're trying to look away from just the internal processes when you're looking at the customer journey, but to actually improve and create this continuous improvement loop, you do need to look back or connect this back to the internal processes, right? So, um, yeah, how, how do you actually create this this link back? Is, is, is that something that, you, that you've that you seen or, or thought about? Yeah, I think that comes back to, to, to the, I think, one of the first points uh, we mentioned, that we did the operational uh, efficiency, efficiency uh, analysis as well, uh, and we connected it to the different dashboards and the KPIs. Uh, because since the solution for the improvement of the customer journey it lies mainly into uh, improvements within our operational uh, efficiency, we should first have all the numbers uh, clear about that process. So we're now ensuring that we can measure almost everything in this process um, so people can monitor what's going on, when it's improving, when it's not. Um, and also increasing the data literacy of everyone in the team so that everyone is aware of those numbers and you can have a team goal to improve your KPIs. Uh, so we're trying to create that link by having an additional operational efficiency uh, analysis, but also having on a daily basis just the numbers in front of you, discuss them in, uh, in the day start with the team, you know, what happened yesterday? Why did this number go up or why did this number go down? Um, and I think that's uh, that's a way we're doing it uh, at this moment. Right. Yes, and that really does create this kind of feedback loop because you're looking, you're seeing every day basically the actions that you're taking, how they are affecting those numbers that you that you know are the the important numbers to measure on an operational level. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing we're missing is that not not all of those actions are derived from our process mining analysis, and sometimes are coming from uh, from other tools or maybe sometimes gut feel. To, to have an action. Uh, so we want to push people towards the process finding <laughs> analysis to, before they take actions. <laughs> right, it's, it's usually a mix anyway, right? I mean, there's some, once you know what you want to measure, um, it, it can be very well measured in a different way than with process mining often, right? Once you know where you place the data measure points and what you what you want to know every day, but actually getting there and having this understanding, that's like the, the basis being to be able to do that in the first place. Right. And so, so we had some other questions also that uh, came up um, in the discussion. So, for example, Tsui was uh, asking about data privacy um, and whether that was an issue or whether you anonymized the data. How, how, how did you go about this topic? Yeah, and I think it's a really good question, especially as uh, with GDPR still not everything is 100% clear all the time. And of course, we are creating this huge data set. Um, we are, we're lucky that we are analyzing on a company level and not on a person's level. So uh, we don't link to an actual person uh, for this analysis. And next to this, we also used uh, a code for a company that's not linked to the direct uh, company in the data set itself. Yes, yeah, that's a really important topic for people to, to be aware of what they can, what they're allowed to, but also what they need, what kind of data they need, right, for, for, the, for the analysis they want to do and to be really responsible. Yeah, and, and that's why you always have to balance, of course, also of, to not overspec your analysis, so mm. to not include too many columns. You need that because you want to keep a clear analysis, but you also want to keep thinking, do I really need this data uh, for privacy options? And even if you're working on a company level, you still need to consider, is this data really necessary? And if not, I'm going to leave it out because you just want to be careful with anybody's data. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, Nick also asked about uh, a specific issue with respect to the timestamps. So he said that a common issue would be that you can see when a task has finished um, or the processing of a case was finished, but not, not necessarily when um, a task has started. Was, was this an issue at all in the data you, an you analyzed? 
Um, no, in the, in the data we analyzed, I don't think uh, this was the issue here, but we thought that Nick was also referring to the fact that once you start to look at your operational uh, processes, you want to see what is happening exactly with a case. And luckily, we were able to do the analysis for the cases on a way more detailed level. So we had all data uh, from the creation of the case uh, to uh, whom was it uh, routed first, to whom was it routed next, uh, which time since it had happened, also when was it eventually resolved. So we had all those timestamps for each of the cases, so we could really follow it through its entire journey within the organization. Um, so luckily we had that more specific data, but we didn't have that issue during the analysis we did uh, for the customer journey. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also, yeah, Reen, but also some other people were interested maybe in, in a few more details uh, about the data preparation that you did in ClickSense, as you described. So maybe, yeah, can you just elaborate a little bit more, like how you prepared the data there? Yeah, I think uh, some people also commented there's a lot like Power BI, which is uh, true, uh, although I don't work with Power BI at the moment. Uh, ClickSense has a lot of plugins to uh, add uh, common data sources like our CRM uh, dynamics system, but also uh, many more. Um, I think it works very user friendly and we were lucky at when we started already a lot of data sources were, were connected to our Click Enterprise system, so we use a cloud system. Um, and then Martijn created in the load script of Click, um, uh, he created the script in the in the back end where all data was aggregated on a customer level and then on the front end of Click, you, you don't have to do any more complex coding, but as a user from the business, like me, for example, you can just drag and drop the, the columns you want. Um, and that's a, a simplified version how it works. Right, so that in that way, the analyst can get easy access to the data and it's fresh data and they can basically get it from, from the data pool and um, do the analysis yeah. that, they want to, that they want to do. Yeah, so you're always working with live data and you can also not uh, have people working with different data sets because it's all linked uh, via the same data marts. Right. Okay, great. Well, that's that's all the time that we have uh, right now for today. Thank you both for coming back. We will continue the discussion in the in the channel, so that it's the yeah. the, to, uh, the total channel in our um, Slack com camp campfire community. So please, um, yeah, go there and continue to ask more questions, and uh, let's continue the discussion. And uh, we will be back with today's practice talk, uh, quarter to the hour. Uh, and we'll go on a quick break until then. See you. See you quarter two. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Nadja. Thank Thanks, Carmen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.